Turn with me, please, in your Bibles as we begin this morning. To a passage I would like to bring to our attention on this last Sunday of the year. Philippians chapter 4. I suppose that as much as any time in recent history, or at least even the entire history of our country, certainly in my lifetime, we're living in anxious times. I think you would probably all agree that things are uh, pretty messed up in the world and that things that are happening cause men to be anxious and concerned. Globally, we look around the world and our current leadership of our own country has us on the brink of war with possibly more than one nation. China is flexing its muscles. Its jets come close to our jets and close to our warships, and they're flexing their muscles around Taiwan. Ukraine and Russia are at war that we're footing the bill for, and uh, that brings us in conflict with Russia, and we're likely on the brink of war with them, or we could be. Israel is fighting with Hamas, the militant Palestinians, also with global implications in what is happening there, as they sometimes have to close the seaways because of terrorists that are happening uh, attacking and it disrupts our own economy and our own nation. North Korea continues to send missiles towards Japan and now claims to have missiles that can reach around the world and they have nuclear capabilities. Iran continues to have preparations for nuclear capability capabilities and they are a terrorist nation and so they'll have nuclear capabilities and who knows what they would do with them all of these global things are going on right now in our life but aside from global concerns we have our own national concerns America's debt is almost incalculable. It is so, we are so in debt that our children and our grandchildren will be paying for it. And that's if we stop getting in debt, which we're not. We give aid to other countries, we give aid to Ukraine, we give aid to this and that. Where do we get the money? We borrow it from China. So we borrow money to give money, and all we do is get further in debt, even to pay the interest on the loan. It's astounding if we stop to think about it, how much in debt we are, and it's increasing every second. In many places in our own country, crime is out of control. Drug use, alcoholism, gangs, all taking place in some cities and some parts of our own country. It wasn't that long ago that people took over part of Seattle and part of the uh, Portland area and part of the Washington State area and just declared them to be their own little countries. Setting fire to police cars and buildings and getting away with all kinds of looting. Look at the, the mobs that rush into stores and grab things off the shelf and rush out all together. And they don't even get caught or charged if they are. Out of control. Not to mention political crimes that we're seeing 
and have been seeing for years, where we cannot even trust our own elections as they lie and steal and cheat and are paid for by you and me. Our southern border is all but non-existent as the area is controlled by Mexican drug cartels and not even by our own border patrol because they've been rendered helpless by the policies of the current administration. And people are flooding into America, bringing with them drugs, disease, crime, terrorism, thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands every day coming in to our country. And babies are still being murdered in mother's wombs for profit in America. And it is so important to one particular political party that they're willing to pay for a woman to go from a state that does not allow abortion up to the time of birth to a state that does just to kill their kid. It's like their golden calf. It's all we're going to hear about in the coming year from one particular party. If you elect them, a woman's right to choose will be long gone. Right to choose what? Who has a right to choose to kill someone? No one. And yet that is what is taking place every day in our land. And now on top of that, children's bodies are being mutilated by operations that are guaranteed by political parties so that you can transform from one gender to another and ruin a child for life, mutilate them for life in the name of what? Freedom? Families are being torn apart. The biblical family unit of that has been so central to our country and to our lifestyle from forever is not only under attack, it is being destroyed. As men marry men and women marry women and they're given rights to even adopt and have children. We know of a entire family that was involved in the adoption of children for fam families bringing good Christian families, children from different parts of the world, they could not do it any longer because the government made them give babies to men couples or women couples. And so they decided to stop. It's tragic that the family is being destroyed where they're not even having children anymore. Husband and wives get married and they don't even have kids for fear that it's too expensive or too hard. And going with that, inflation at record levels is causing extreme economic strain on families day after day. This is what we see. This is what is going on. Globally, nationally, and even personally. Christians even should be appalled at these things. And you're all sitting there going, oh my gosh, 
all these things that he's talked about, all these things that he's mentioned, that's the tip of the iceberg. We should be appalled at what's going on. We should weep over the sin that is so rampant. And we don't. Life just goes on. What are we to do? What should we do? Throw our hands up? Hide under the covers? What should we do? Look at your text. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. On this last day of this tired old year of 2023, I thought it might be wise to examine what God's Word tells us to do, or how to act in light of these circumstances, and this would perhaps give us a bit of a perspective, perhaps a bit of a... Uh, a way to face and deal with these problems in the coming year. But I'd like to actually begin with what God tells us here in the text in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So in the midst of these problems, in the midst of these trials, in the midst of these global, national, and personal dilemmas, be rejoicing in all things. We are to rejoice always, the text says. Rejoice always. That would include in the midst of these dilemmas, in the midst of these trials, in and as we go through these difficult times, Rejoice always. Now, you know what uh, the word means. You know what it means to rejoice. Do you? It's to have joy. It is to have joy. Be joyful. And did you ever notice that the word is rejoice? So it's almost like double. It's joy and Rejoy. It's to have double joy. Rejoice. Have joy in your heart. Have joy in your being. Be joyful in your life. His repeated for emphasis. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say Rejoice. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3, just across the page. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. There it is. It's a safeguard for you. Rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. He repeats it. For emphasis, do you ever stop to think that Christians are to be a joyful people? Of all people in the world, we should be joyful. We should have joy. We're going to say why, but I mean, we should be joyful. And yet, how often is that not the case? How often do we focus on the woes and the weariness and the dreaded stuff that's going on and it robs us of our joy? Christians are supposed to be joyful and I think some of us are a bad testimony sometimes. We are to be joyful. It's, it's a command. Believe it or not, talk about that more in a moment. But think about what the proverb says. 
Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 22 tells us that a joyful heart is good medicine. A joyful heart is good medicine. We have ailments. We have problems and diseases and we look for cures. We look for medication. We look for medicine to help us heal these troubles, heal these diseases. And yet the Bible tells us that a joyful heart is good medicine. How much better is it to go through times of trial when you have joy? When you have actual joy. When you are being joyful. Now, I, I, I know some of you. I know some of you well. And I've seen some of you in difficult times. I've seen some of you in sickness. And yet, sometimes you still joke. And, and it just makes it so much easier to go through. A joyful heart is good medicine. It soothes our sorrows. It wipes away our tears and helps us to even recover. Isn't the world a better place when there's joy? Now, again, we've just come through the celebration of Christmas, and I'm sure that many of you with your families last week, yeah, last week, got to gather around, maybe a meal, maybe open some presents, did some things. You remember the birth of Christ, I hope. And you celebrated together, and there was joy. So all of those things I mentioned at the beginning, all of the tension in the world, all of the wars, all of the rumors of wars, all of the political nonsense, all of the crime, all of the drugs, all of the stuff going on at our southern border. That was all still happening. Yet you were able to get together with your family and have a time, a season of joy. Joy makes it possible, at least helps as we go through these things. It's so much better when you have joy in your heart. You can face your trials and difficulties of life when you are joyful or rejoicing. And my dear brothers and sisters, make no mistake, as I said a moment ago, this is a command from God. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Again, rejoice. It's a command. But think about it. What kind of a loving God do we have? People think that God is so mean. Oh, God is so mean. We got to do all this stuff. Being a Christian is so hard. And it is. But here we also have a God that is so loving that he commands us to be joyful. What a loving God. What a gracious God. A God who commands you to have Joy in your heart. It's a joyful duty given to his followers, as one put it. Be joyful. Rejoice. A gracious God tells us to be joyful. And yet, how seldom do some obey this command? And they would say, oh, oh, but you, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what my life is like. You don't know how hard I have it or how hard it is. All right, let's move on here a little bit and understand the circumstances that we see in the midst of us. Because it says, rejoice always. And rejoicing always would mean to rejoice in spite or in the midst of your discomforts and pains and sorrows and afflictions. Rejoice always. And here I want for us to take a little bit of a look at what's going on and understand who is writing this and what was happening as he was writing. This epistle, as you know, of course, was written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, as he writes this epistle, was in prison. Look at chapter 1. 
He was in prison under God, a guard. Chapter 1 of Philippians, down to verse 7. For it is not only right for me to, to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So he's in prison as he's writing. Look, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So he's in prison, and obviously he knew the guards because he witnessed to them. So he was in prison under guard, Look at verse 17. The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So not only was he imprisoned, but he had people that were seeking to cause him distress in his imprisonment. The other thing I would mention to you, that the book of Philippians was written towards the end of Paul's life. Most of you know that he had trouble with his eyes. He had very poor eyesight. And so most of his epistles were not written by him, but by a secretary, an amanuensis, someone who would write for him. Occasionally, you would see at the end of an epistle, I write, see with what big letters I write. He had to write a little bit just to let you know it was him. And the reason his letters were so big, because his eyesight was so poor. He had bad eyesight. And so he's an old man writing this. Very close to death. In poor health. Think of all that he went through all of the beatings, the shipwrecks in his life, and all of these things. Here he is now at the end of his life, advanced in years. Plus, he had all of the tensions and all of the problems that come from being a pastor. Look at chapter 3, down to verse 18. Chapter 3. For many walk of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. So he's had some brethren who have gone out from among the flock, left. We know that they were not saved, for they have gone out from among us because they were not of us, First John. But it still causes great pain to a pastor, especially to an apostle Paul, when someone just leaves and goes away falls back into the world or whatever they would do. So Paul had all of these things going on and it was very difficult. So he knows a bit about hardships. He knows a bit about trials. They were very real to him. He might have had enough of reason to be depressed. He might have had enough reason for personal anxiety or angst. You can imagine that it was easy, it's easy for someone when things are going well to say, rejoice, be happy. But that's not the case. 
That's not what was going on here with Paul. He had been going through all of these trials. He was at what we might call at the bottom. Towards the end of his life, with all of the hardships and difficulties, even men like Paul are not immune, are not immune to the discouragement that may come in life. As you have heard me say many times, the best of men are men at best. And sometimes we're prone to discouragement. We're prone to anxiety. We see what's going on and it troubles our hearts. And we can't even take it personally and become anxious. And yet, in this epistle alone, the Apostle Paul uses the concept of rejoicing no less than 16 times. 16 times. And you might notice that we're in the last chapter, and it's only chapter 4. So in four chapters, he uses the concept of rejoicing 16 times. Now, according to my math, that's an average of four times a chapter. Four times a chapter. He's telling us, rejoice, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Don't be anxious, but rejoice in God. Even with his own personal experience, despite all that he's gone through, in light of all that he's gone through, he still says, rejoice. He, till, he still tells the Philippians to rejoice. And he still tells us to rejoice in all things, in all situations, globally, nationally, personally, in all situations, rejoice! Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. We are to be a joyful people. But this is not to say that we are just being giddy in spite of the facts. Like, if you could still be happy when all is going on around you, you don't know what's happening. That's not the case. That's not what he's saying. We're not just to be giddy and, and you know, ignore what's going on. Don't worry. Be happy. That's not what he's saying. This is principled joy. Look at the text. Look what the text says in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. It's not just ignoring what's happening and being happy. We focus on God. We know God. We know that God is glorious. We know that God is sovereign. We understand that he is in control. And so despite what's going on in the world, and even in light of what's going on in the world, or in our country, we can still rejoice in the Lord, in God, in the midst of the hardships and the trials. We have peace with God, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes or surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. We have peace in our heart. We have confidence and peace even in our mind, knowing that our God is in control. There are things beyond this world that we choose to dwell on, things beyond this world that are more important. Look down to verse 8. Brethren, 
Whatever is true, what is true? Thy word is truth. God's word is true. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, what is honorable? You realize that one of the, one of the biggest problems that we face in our world today is the lack of morality. People don't even consider what is right and wrong anymore. They just sin without thought to the consequences or to whether or not something is good or bad or right or wrong. We choose to focus on things that are honorable. And for us, honorable is honoring God. We choose to honor God. And how do you honor God? Do you know why God gave the commandments to Israel? That the world would look at them and see in them a different kind of people. A people who were not liars, murderers, thieves, adulterers. People who worship the living God. These people are different. This is why God gave us the law, that we would honor him. And by honoring him, point people to him. That people would see in you a good people, an honorable people, a moral people. Our country has lost its morality. Our country has lost any semblance of honor to God. And yet, we choose to look at those things. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right. Following Christ is right. Whatever is pure, where is the purity in our day? Where is the purity with, among our, our young ones? One of the things that we have printed in for prayer requests is the purity of our children. That they would remain pure and chaste, even in a world that seems to have thrown that aside. And even little kids are being involved in um, sensual sins. We choose to be pure. Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. True love to the brethren, to the spouse, to our God. Whatever is of good repute. We should be men and women even boys and girls in school who are looked at as being good. That's a good kid. You know you get made fun of when you're a good kid. Goody two shoes or whatever. You get made fun of. But yet that's what God, that's what honors God. That you would be good, of good repute. If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. And then he goes on and says, The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What are the things that you learn from him? What are the things that you receive from him? You receive salvation in God. You receive salvation in Christ. So what do you dwell on? Not the global things, not the national things, not the problems. We dwell on the fact that God is in glory and that he has saved me by his grace and that ultimately I will go to be with him. No matter what this world throws at me. No matter what it brings, no matter how hard it gets, even if we do go to war, rejoice, because you're going to heaven. Rejoice, because you 
are one of God's children. This is what we choose to focus on. Turn, if you would please, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. And see how Peter puts it. First Peter chapter 4. And if you would look down to verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. What? This is a long time ago. So, as, Paul, as Peter said to his people, as he, to those that he wrote to, don't be surpri surprised by the fiery trial. Don't be surprised by the fiery trial in 2024. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Imagine that. If you're reviled, if you have a fiery ordeal, you're blessed. You're blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. This is what he's talking about. And it's to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ. That's what we looked at last Lord's Day as we celebrated the Lord's Supper. Christ gave his life for us. And as he died to save us from our sins, we, as it were, have died to this world and have been raised to new life in him. So we are those who have partaken of the sufferings of Christ in that they are applied to us and cover our sins and we will be bound for glory with God, with Christ, with the saints in heaven. That's what we focus on. That's what we dwell on. Not on the fiery ordeals as though something strange were happening. We're not going to be immune. We may have more hardships in the years to come because of the sin that is rampant in the world and in our country. But we choose to focus on Christ and upon God and know that we have a reward that is with him. Now back to our text in Philippians 4. And I want to open up a little bit more now what he says in verse 6. The word anxious that is used there in the Greek actually has two different meanings. And it does even in our own meaning. In the uh, King James Version, the word is actually translated careful. Uh, I believe it's uh, translated in the King James as uh, careful. Be careful for nothing. But that, that doesn't gain what the, the sense that Paul is using here. The, the word is used in two different ways. First of all, it's thoughtful concern. Anxious. You're, you have, there's a time when it's right to be anxious. You have thoughtful concern. Look right here over to chapter 2 and verse 19. Philippians 2, 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will general, general, genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Same word. 
See, it's not wrong to be genuinely concerned. There's that sense of the word where it's fine to be concerned. In fact, if you look back a little further to 1 Corinthians, and I, I can't take much time here, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look down to verse 20. Well, he's dealing with the uh, um, church and the people in the church. Verse 22, on the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and then our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our... <clears throat> whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God, who so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which is lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. That's the word. That we have genuine care for each other in the church. What a difference it makes when you have genuine care for the brethren in the church. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But back to Philippians chapter 4. That's the thoughtful concern. But what Paul is using here is the sense of the word that is to be troubled with cares, to be overburdened, to be preoccupied. This is the biting of your nails over what's going on, anxiousness. That's the other part of the word, and that's the part that Paul's actually speaking of here. So it's not uh, something that we want. It's being so concerned and preoccupied that there's nothing but doom and gloom on the horizon. And it's all going to fall on me. That's the kind of anxiousness Paul is speaking of. So that's the meaning of the, the text. But what about the message of the text to us? And here, too, there are two sides. There are two sides. We ought to have genuine concern for what is going on around us. We ought to. How can we not care about our fellow Christians who are going through trials? I mean, right now, there are Christians in Israel who are in the midst of the battle. They may not be in the army of the Israeli army, but maybe they're in, in the midst of the conflict. Same thing with Ukraine. We know Ukraine's a corrupt country. Russia's a corrupt country. They're both corrupt countries. But guess what? There are Christians in both of those countries. And we can't help but feel pain for our brothers and sisters around the world involved in these things. That's the genuine care and concern. We can't ha help but have concern for those who have loved ones, children who have been killed in schools in recent years in riots, and for the children who die in mother's wombs. We are not told to ignore the crime. We are not told to ignore the sin that is all around us. We are to weep for the sin, weep for the crime, weep for the loss. That is more what we do. Weep for the children, weep for the husbands and the wives who are the victims of the crimes that are going on all around us. That's the good part of this word. We are to have concern. And yet, it's improper when this concern overshadows the sovereignty of God who is on the throne. When you start worrying so much about what's going on in Ukraine or Russia or China or Israel or wherever, and you lose sight of the fact that God is on his throne, still, that's sin. 
Be not anxious. Don't lose sight of the fact that God is in control. That's not just a saying. That's a fact. God is sovereign. God is on control. You're in control. You remember that picture that Isaiah saw with God exalted and lifted up, seated on the throne. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God who is creator and in control of all things. I am so thankful that I can trust him that the things that are going on in Ukraine, in Russia, in Israel, in Hamas, at our border are all under the purview of his sovereign decree. And so we can rejoice. We don't want to be drawing people away from God. I, I can't take the time to turn there, but I wanted to turn to the parable of the sower. And you remember, he was speaking about some of the, when the, the thorns grew up on the seeds, and what did they do? They choked out the word. That's this kind of anxiety. It chokes out your joy. Don't let anxiety over these things choke out your joy. We need to have joy in Christ. Anxiety can deplace, deplace our dependency on God and on Christ. And it can ruin your life. And it can ruin worship. When people start worrying about little things in a church, it draws them away from the big picture. I've told you before about some churches where I've pastored where people are so worried about this stupid little thing or that silly little thing. And it just causes divisions and fractions. I, I had a pastor friend who told me that he went to preach in a church one time and the carpet was right down the middle. One side was gold and one side was blue. That's because they were fighting over what color to make the carpet. How silly! When you think that we come to worship the God of heaven and earth! And the things that we should be dwelling on, even in accordance with our text, are things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and of good repute. That's what we should be dwelling on. Little things can take away from your worship and from your joy. Again, consider the source of the message. Paul was in prison, helpless, in poor health. And yet he had joy. My dear brother and sister, leave your anxieties at the foot of the cross. Leave your anxieties before the sovereign God of heaven and earth. He is the one who orders all things and brings all things to pass. And you can have peace, the peace of God, which passes all comprehension. Leave your anxiety before him. And you ask, but how can I do that? It's not easy to do. We see what's going on and we get upset. We have stress in our own lives and it takes us away and it causes us to be anxious. What can I do? He tells us, be anxious, verse 6, for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Be rejoicing in all things. Be anxious for nothing. Be praying in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. The term everything again that is mentioned here when he says be anxious for nothing but in everything, the term everything includes Every time, constantly, always, every day. 
That's what he's saying. Pray every day. Pray all the time. Constantly be praying. As often as there is need, as often as there is opportunity, pray. Put it to you this way. Christian, my dear Christian brother and sister, don't get anxious. Get on your knees. Don't get anxious. Get on your knees before the God who is able to answer. Here's the great need of the Christian. Here's the great help of the Christian in time of need. The aid of your life, the help that you desire, is to come before God and He will bring peace. In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. In all of these ways, prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, don't hold anything back. Pour it all out before God. Pray to Him. I did want to point to one text here in regards to laying out everything before God, and I promise to go through it quickly. But if you would, please, find Second Kings chapter 18. It is one of the greatest examples of laying all things before God in the midst of trial. Second Kings chapter 18. And if you would look at verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Shennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. He's putting a siege on Jerusalem, on the cities of Judah. And if you would, uh, from there, look over to verse 28. as he sends this guy, Rabshakeh, to speak to the people. And in verse uh, 28, Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Judean language, saying, Hear the word of the great king of Syria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from my hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. And this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. You know what he's saying? Don't listen to your king if he tells you God can deliver you, because you can't. It's not going to happen. Look down to verse 33. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his hand from the hand of the king of Assyria? In other words, no, no god has ever delivered their country from us. We're much too strong. Don't you listen to Hezekiah when he tells you that your God is going to be able to deliver you. You know what he's doing? He's defying the living God. They're coming up against the, the king, against Jerusalem, against the nation of Israel, and defying the living God. Now chapter 19, over to verse 14. This is what Hezekiah does, the king. Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. You know what's happening? An army has come up against our city. An army has come up against us to kill us, to ravage us, to take our women and children, to destroy us. That's tension. That's anxiety. That's trial. What do you do? The king takes the message, goes up to the house of the Lord, and spreads it out before the Lord. And as a guy prayed before the Lord and said, O oh Lord, the God of Israel, who, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone are 
you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear upon your eye. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And listen to the words of Shennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the king of kings of Assyria have devastated the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they are not gods but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, so they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord, our God, I pray, deliver us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. What a great prayer. In the midst of the trial of these people coming up, he lays out the request before God. Praise God. Oh, God, these other gods, small g gods, are not gods. They're wood and stone. But you are God. You are the living God. Show the world. And what happens? Verse 35. Then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. Shennacherib goes back to his home and his own sons kill him. God showed that he was God. People, our God is God. He is the sovereign God. So back to Philippians 4 as we close. There is no issue, not a global issue, not a national issue, not a personal issue that is kept from God, that God does not know about, that God is not in control of. So what we are to do is to dwell on Him. Verse 8 again. We are to dwell on these things, whatever is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and of good repute. Dwell on these things, he says. Not on the things that are happening in the world. Dwell on these things because they are of God. And our God is God. And our God is is in control of all things. And remember, he will grant us peace. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 7, the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your heart. You understand that the peace spoken of here, remember Jesus said, my peace I give you, the peace of Christ. He was never sinfully anxious in all his life. Now, he had times like at the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying and there were concerns, but never sinfully anxious. And he gives us his peace. But here we see them. He said, this peace that passes all understanding is the opposite of anxiousness. Anxiousness is anxiousness. Peace is peace. When we dwell on the things of God, our hearts will be at peace and it will drive out the anxiety. I wonder if some of you have ever had that happen to you when you've been at a time when perhaps things just caught up with you and it just got so, so bad and you got so scared and so worried or whatever that you were really anxious. And then all of a sudden you remembered or dwelled and God drew you back to himself and you looked to him and you had this overwhelming peace that came over you. It's a wonderful feeling to have peace in a sovereign God to have confidence in this God. As Paul said, it's something that surpasses comprehension. So, 
even though I dwell in the valley of the shadow of death. God will care for me and comfort me and lead me to still waters and feed me good food. Even though you're in the valley of death, look to God, look to Christ and have a peace that passes all understanding. Dear Christian, as we come to a new year tonight, tomorrow is a new year. May we rest in Christ for everything. And as a result, may we be joyful Christians, which is what we are supposed to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how can we face a world without you? I do not know how people who are unsaved do it. I thank you so much for the assurance that you give us that you are on the throne, that the peace that you bring us because of it. You are a sovereign God, a great God, and you bring us peace for which we give you so much thanks. And Father, I do pray that you would also give us this joy in our lives, that people would see in us a joy that comes from you, that comes from serving you. This we pray for today, and this we pray for the new year, and this we pray for all of our lives, and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.